club. There's nothing a damn bit bright about sunshine when you're 17 and you see it from the wrong side of a jail cell window. It isn't that I'm moping for my lost freedom or anything. I wouldn't give a half a crap for my life anymore now that the crew is scattered to the four winds and all I have left of Daisy is her parting note in the waistband of my jeans and a wilted dandelion dangling between my fingers. But it seems to me that the man upstairs could have marked my downfall with a terrific thunderstorm or at least a few nasty black clouds out of the west. When there's a war or a funeral or some other sad thing going on in the movies, the sky usually turns dark and ugly and the rain pours down in buckets. The longer I stare at the square of sunlight streaming through the tiny window of my cell and stealing across the floor, the lonelier I feel. August 27th, 1986 is slipping by the same as every other hot, heavy day, and I'm the only one in the world who knows that nothing will ever be all right again. It hasn't always been this way. I ought to have known better than to believe I could reach out and snag a piece of paradise, but for a little while I had it on my fingertips. Breaks are hard to come by for kids from the projects, though, and sure enough, all I ended up with at the last second was empty hands. I'm doing my level best to hold off a flood of memories, but my mind keeps drifting back to the sweltering summer evening when the chain of events began that shattered my world into a zillion pieces. First thing tomorrow morning, some juvenile court judge will decide if my life is worth rebuilding. Maybe he'll have better luck with my future than I did with my past. Chapter 1 The sun was low in the west when me and Brian and Stacy got to the baseball diamond behind the high school. The heat had backed off to that sort of sticky mugginess that makes July evenings in Texas feel like they drag on forever. The field was crowded. Usually the students at the public high school in Bertha City blew off that team pride stuff parents and teachers were always screaming about. But lots of us showed up when we took on the rich kids from the classy private academy across town because we wanted to see them get stomped. You might think there was a lot of bitterness between us. The cops obviously thought so because they were swarming all over the place during the game. But for the most part, it was like we lived on two separate planets. We stayed downtown and the rich kids stuck to their own turf on the other side of the highway. They looked at us like we were dirt, and we didn't look at them at all unless it was to kick the crap out of their baseball team. Anyway, the only place left on the bleachers was at the bottom near the popcorn stand. We chased off a couple of junior high kids and spread our jackets on the splintery benches to claim spots for Tim and Mark, the other two guys who always hung out with us. Want a Coke, Rick? Stace asked me. I flipped him some change from my jeans pocket, and he and Brian headed for the soda machine. They went everywhere together. Stace and Brian Thomas were twins, and you could barely tell them apart with their light skin and jet black hair, but they were as different as two guys could be. Stace banged his gums together way too much. I mean, there was no shutting that kid up. He was always clowning around and making funny remarks and mouthing off to teachers and cops. It landed him in a heap of trouble, but he really couldn't help it. Brian was a quiet, bookish type who made good grades in school and played tennis. Not even the crew could get him to talk much. He mostly kept to himself, thinking his own thoughts and hardly ever voicing them, till you got him on a court with a racket in his hand, and then he was all action. He and Stace were usually dressed sharper than I was because he had a real family with two working parents. You can't judge guys by their clothes, though. The twins were all right for being two years younger than the rest of us, and we'd always accepted them as part of the crew. The crew had grown up as tight as brothers. There was this blonde chick sitting by herself on the bench below mine with the black and tan German shepherd lying at her feet. I nodded and smiled at her, but... She didn't glance around, so I turned away. I'm not like some guys, always having to be noticed by chicks. 
and it was awful hot to knock myself out being social. I wasn't real taken with girls yet anyway, not like Tim, who could have taught old Romeo a whole pack of slick tricks. All that dating stuff seemed like a lot of hassle to me. I mean, a guy chugged along, just fine, doing pretty much whatever he wanted. Then he got hooked up with a girl, and the next thing you knew, he was falling all over himself trying to be respectable. Give me a break. The twins came back with the drinks, and after a while, Tim and Mark joined us. Anyone need a cancer stick? Tim pulled a pack of smokes out of his pocket and passed it around. We all lit up, all but Brian, who was too serious about tennis to blacken his precious lungs. He'd had his eye on a sports scholarship to some big eastern college or other practically since he started kindergarten. Tim Bennett was a redhead with sort of shifty-looking eyes and a good build. He was tall, but he slouched all the time. He looked like a pretty tough customer because he had this set to his face that let you know he'd back up anything he said. He would, too. The crew joked that his rap sheet took up its own private file cabinet down at the police station, fighting mostly and drinking. Tim wouldn't go out of his way to be nice to anybody he didn't like. But he'd offer a stranger his last dime in a heartbeat if he thought no one was watching. Mark Romero was small and wiry. He was a kick to be around, always laughing. He didn't cut up like Stace. He was just real happy, except when something touched off his blazing hot temper. He cussed too much, maybe, but most of it was in Spanish, so it didn't count. He never needed booze to have fun. He could get a thrill out of a scrap or a baseball game or anything else that happened to be going on. Hey, babe, Tim called to the little blonde. Your boyfriend's kind of hairy, ain't he? He wasn't always the nicest to girls at first, but he was a charmer once he picked them up, and for some reason, most of them would have followed him right into a burning building. She turned toward us. For your information, Captain is a guide dog. She was a cute girl. She had on a yellow dress that was snug around the middle with straps that went over her bare shoulders. Her awesome figure caught my attention first thing. But when I gave her a closer look, I noticed something funny about her eyes. They were sort of blank in her face. It wasn't every day you saw a chick with a dog at a baseball game, so we were all interested. What's a guide dog? Stace asked. Tim fired him a nasty scowl, and Stace decided to give up the floor. I can't see it, so he's trained to help me get around. It's really great because I can go anywhere by myself since I got him. She smiled, and she had the most knockout smile I'd ever seen. It lit up her whole face. He behaves himself so well, just waiting quietly for me, that sometimes people don't even notice him till we get ready to leave a restaurant or something. A sly look came into Tim's eyes, and I figured he was about to start in with his usual crap. I wished he'd let the girl be. He could get real mean lots of times without trying to when he lost interest in picking up a chick. Those kind of kicks leave me cold, especially if the girl is blind or something. That's a good one. You're not really blind. You just couldn't get a two-legged date for the game. Tim wiggled his fingers under her nose. How many fingers am I holding up? Her smile faded. She spoke tiredly, like she'd said the same thing a zillion times before. I'm really blind. I can't see your fingers. God, she was a fox. Most girls would kill for those golden curls and that fair skin. I'm blonde and light-colored myself, but it's not such a big deal for a guy. Anyway, if you weren't looking right at her eyes, you'd hardly know she was blind. She was dressed too nice to be from the bad part of town, but not like a rich kid either, so I guess she must live in one of the middle-class subdivisions out east. I wondered what she was doing alone in her neighborhood with night coming on. Tim moved close to her on the bench and laid a hand on her knee. Try to guess what I look like. I knew she was getting mad and scared by the way she clenched her bubblegum between her teeth. I don't know what you look like, and I don't care either. I know what you act like. Show off. That girl had nerve. Tim began to chant, tapping his finger on her knee. Three blind mice, three blind mice. Oh, that's original, she snapped. 
too cool, a babe with an attitude. He laughed and put an arm around her. That's the way I like him. The fear was plain in her face by then, but she held her head high. I heard her quick, shallow breathing as she tried to pull away. Take your hands off me. His grip on her tightened. Hey, boys, meet my main squeeze. Love is blind, you know. He snickered at his own joke. I'll lay off, Tim, I said. What? He let go of her and stared at me, surprised. You heard me. I said lay off. A year before, he would have knocked me flat and not thought twice about it. I'd gotten to be a fairly good size, though, and no slouch of a fighter, and lately he wasn't too sure he was ready to take me on. It put some strain between us because Tim had always been used to giving the orders, but we didn't fight much among ourselves. He hesitated, then stood up, hitched his thumbs in his belt loops, and swaggered off toward a group of chicks without saying another word. He didn't come back. I turned to the girl. Don't take Tim too serious. He's a jerk sometimes, but he don't mean nothing by it. She shifted uneasily on the bench, seeming to decide whether or not she could trust me. Are you going to start in on me now? No, I don't get off on that. What's your name? It's Desiree, but everybody calls me Daisy. I'm Rick, that's Mark, and those two morons are Brian and Stace. She put out her hand, and we each shook it awkwardly. I don't bite or anything, I promise, she said. The five of us sat there watching the game, and Captain just stayed stretched out on the ground with his head on Daisy's foot as quietly as she had said he would. Those rich kids thought they looked cool as hell in their spiffy white uniforms, but they were covered with dirt and sweat the same as our guys pretty soon. We all got a laugh out of that. I went out for baseball once, but me and the coach couldn't stand each other. I hated him ordering me around like he thought he owned me or something. Me and Daisy hit it off right away. I'm usually not much of a talker, but she loosened me up somehow. Before I really noticed what I was doing, I moved down to sit on the bench next to her and started telling her stuff I didn't even like to think about, much less say out loud. My dad took my mom to some fancy restaurant in Amarillo last Valentine's Day, I said. He'd been saving up for months so they could go. My voice hardened. I guess he should have put new brakes on the car instead. They skidded off the road on their way home in the pouring rain. They were both dead in a ditch before they knew what hit him. My God, that's awful. Daisy touched my arm for a second, then pulled her hand away and bit her lip. My dad's in jail. He drank a little more than usual one night last fall. I can't even remember what I said that set him off, but it was probably nothing, like always. I ended up in the hospital and then in foster care. Oh, I thought that sounded dumb the second I said it, and then I made it worse by adding, Your foster parents aren't from around here then. I haven't seen you before. Nope, they live in Amarillo. Daisy made a sour face. My foster mother freaked out whenever I did anything by myself. She cut my meat for me. She laid out matching clothes every morning. She probably would have dressed me if I hadn't drawn the line. She kept calling me a poor little deer. Pity makes me sick. So me and Captain skipped town as soon as she went to bed last night. Weren't you scared, I asked. Sure, but anything is better than being smothered to death, and I found out years ago that I won't get anywhere if I stay home every time something scares me. Daisy chewed on her lip again and started fiddling with the silver cross that hung on a chain around her neck. Besides, my dad had a parole hearing yesterday, and I wasn't about to stick around and see if he managed to slither out onto the streets. But the social workers will hunt for you, don't you think? They've probably called out the bloodhounds by now. They'll want to track down their helpless little blind girl before her disappearance hits the newspapers and trashes their public image or something. But my dad's the only one who really worries me. What does the sucker look like? I'll kick his butt if I catch him alone in an alley some dark night. How would I know? I've never seen him except in my nightmares. I laughed. I guess that was a stupid question. Daisy shrugged. Forget him anyway. 
He has a court order to stay away from me, and if the parole board had a lick of sense, they kept him locked up tight. Well, you're a gutsy chick. I'll give you that. I tried to picture what it would be like to walk around everywhere with my eyes closed, and I didn't think much of the idea. It didn't seem to slow Daisy down, though. Hey, Rick, check out that old fatso over there. Stays pointed toward the far end of the bleachers. A guy who packs a beer gut like that shouldn't be seen in public without a short. He must think he's a stud, Mark scoffed. He's got to be at least 40, and there he is in the middle of a flock of chicks all young enough to be his daughter. Whenever I glanced up from the game after that, the fat man looked like he was eyeballing Daisy. At first, I blew him off, thinking he'd never seen a girl with a guide dog before and couldn't get a grip on his curiosity. But the way he kept staring at her really started to bug me after a while. Scoping out a chick like she's a slab of meat is pretty low class, but homing in on a blind girl who doesn't know she's being drooled over is downright scummy. If the sick puppy had figured out that Daisy couldn't see and pegged her as an easy target, I wished he'd make a move on her so I'd have a reason to blacken his wandering eyes. He just studied her from a safe distance, though, and the field was too thick with cops for me to pick a fight with him. I did my best to ignore him and keep my mind on the game so I wouldn't lose my temper. But if I could have known at the time how that man was going to plunge all our lives into the pits of hell, I swear to God I would have found a way to kill him on the spot.'